I knew it. I knew it. I was like, okay, we need to go into the office. Um, it's weird. I have a meeting booked in at 10.30 a.m. with HR. You know, it's just weird. You know, mm. you know it's coming. So I wore my black coat and I wore like a black outfit because I knew it was like, Kind of like funeral vibes, you know? Oh like God. Dressed for the occasion. I, I dressed for the occasion. <laughs> Welcome to Proudly Asian, a podcast series that tells bold and proud stories of Asians by Asians. My name is Isabel, your podcast host, and I'm here to find stories that challenge biases we face every day. There's never just one way to look at Asians. This podcast will take you through a deep dive into the life stories, struggles, and triumphs of young Asians around the world. On today's episode, we have Julia Kim, a Korean-Australian content professional based in Sydney. She's also the co-host of Asian Soup Podcast, where she talks about careers and her experience growing up Asian-Australian. She joins us to talk about her life down under and coping with redundancy. Welcome back to Prattly Asian. Now, continuing our Money Smart series in November, we'll be speaking with smart Asians or Asians who have smart personal finance tips from around the world. But of course, for this series, we are not going to be sharing financial advice or we won't be doing stock picking, but rather we are tapping the collective money wisdom from our guests to hopefully prepare you all for some specific money situations and also unexpected events in life. And for this episode, I'm I'm so glad to have our friend Jules who's joining us from Sydney and she's the co-host of Asian Soup Podcast. Jules, welcome to Proudly Asian. Thanks for joining us from Sydney. Thank you for having me, Isabel. (laughs) I'm very excited. Very, very excited to be here. Finally, we get to you know, have a chat with you one-on-one. I think um, last time I got to meet your co-host, Rox, in Hong Kong in person. But I think this is kind of the first time that we're having this one-on-one chat. And I really appreciate that you're open to joining us talking about what we're actually going to talk about this episode. But before we get into that whole conversation for our listeners to get to know you a little bit better, Jules, um, why don't we start with the basics? Tell us a little bit about your background Who are you? What are you? And where did you grow up? Okay, so who am I? (laughs) I am Jules from the Asian Soup podcast. I run a little podcast with my co-host Rox. Uh, We're based in Sydney and we sort of chat about anything really that's sort of top of mind. Um, we don't really have like a content strategy or anything like that. We literally just rock up and say, let's chat about this today. So it's very, very casual and, you know, unscripted. Um, I'm Korean Australian, which means my background is Korean. My parents are Korean and I was born and raised in Australia, um, in Sydney. So I was born and raised in Sydney. I'm in my almost mid thirties. And yeah, that's a little bit about me. Amazing. I'll say. Yeah. yeah, I gotta say your podcast with Rocks was probably like the coziest podcast there is. So for those who are just looking to listen to maybe like two good friends talking about anything in life in a really calming um, setting, Asian Soup Podcast is definitely the best podcast to go for and it does feel like soup you know like soup is very like (laughs) soothing right and then listening to you girls talk is always like ah this is nice (laughs) oh that's like the ultimate compliment thank you so much (laughs) I really enjoy I really enjoy your podcast and I also really enjoy how like vulnerable you girls could get at some point which um that's how the idea of this episode came about because a few episodes ago you talked about you getting made redundant so this is something that we definitely want to touch on because it's happening to a lot of people and we definitely would like to hear your experience about like how 
you got over it, you know, how people can become better prepared if like redundancy might be coming their way. But um, before we talked about redundancy, I'm also curious about your experience growing up as an as a Korean Australian, because actually we don't get a lot of Asian Australian guests on the podcast. Um, it's not because we don't want them here. It's because <laughs> it's just happen that way like we haven't come across a lot of them so I'm so curious like for you growing up in Sydney any interesting moments you can share with us you know what was breakfast like what was um you know the schooling experience like and also um for people who are outside Australia we would always hear um the observation that Asians might be subjected to a lot of um, racism in Australia we also want to know if that's the case for you Mm. yeah so it's interesting I feel like I have to speak very you know accurately on behalf of all my fellow <laughs> Asian Australians just um, your personal experience yeah, this is you don't I'll, speak on behalf of them, yes so, so I will <laughs> mention that yes I am just one of many and this is my personal experience and I think things have changed a lot now like you know, for younger generations living in Australia, like as Asians, it's changed a lot. But for me growing up, like looking back, I could, you know, I feel like a lot has changed. And it was, you know, there were some moments looking back the way you're like, whoa, that was acceptable, you know? Um, Yeah, so I'll, let me, where should I begin? Maybe, um, maybe let's start with breakfast. Mm -hmm. And then we could touch about, touch on to the more rate, Racist yeah. things a bit later. Um, Many questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I grew up uh, growing up with my grandparents as well as my parents and my brother. Um, so my grandparents lived in the same household. And I think that's quite typical for some of us Asians like to grow up with your grandparents. They're almost like kind of babysitting you. as like You know, like they pick me up from school and would have dinner like on a big family table with my grandparents there and so that was sort of my my memory um growing up you know breakfast would typically be anything not breakfasty like Mm. typically like um rice panchan you know like the korean side dishes soup even kimchi you know rice cake soup anything Mm. really heavy was completely acceptable as breakfast um, and you know, it's something that I was a little bit embarrassed about, like I might even hide the fact that I used to have kimchi. Like, why would I explain to someone what kimchi is if they don't even, you know, now it's like so normal and everyone knows what mm-hmm. kimchi is. But back then I think it was something that I wouldn't share. Like it was almost like closet Korean food eating person. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, you hear that story, like, oh, people have dumplings and, in their lunch boxes and it's smelly and you know yeah. um everyone else has sandwiches i was definitely that person as well like i would have sometimes like smelly lunch boxes and it was a little bit like you know when you open mm. the container you're like whoa it smells and um <laughs> but i think i was also very okay with that too like mm-hmm. the breakfast side of things i was like a little bit embarrassed but i think i was sort of also as i got older became more open to sharing my foods with my closer friends so I my my primary school friends were more white Australian mm-hmm. and I think I was lucky in the fact that they were interested in you know my kimbap mm. or like my spam and rice um and they would really some of them really enjoyed it nice. so I think I was really lucky in that sense um but yeah, if we talk about racism, I would say they, you know, over, my overall experience was good growing up here. Um, but definitely there were moments that, you know, it was very, you know, things that wouldn't be acceptable now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it happened more in like public spaces, like people might yell out things like, go back to China mm. or Ching Chong, like, you know, just stuff like that. And you're just like, what? And you're just like a kid. Can you, you know, think about it. I'm just in my little school uniform and doing my own thing. And 
getting yelled at for no reason and I know. from other school kids as well. So there were some moments like that that were really upsetting. Um, yeah, which mm. I, I feel sad that it happened. Um, and normally these yeah. moments kind of happen when you're just going about your day, um, doing your own thing or waiting for the bus. I don't know, for some reason, mm. like a lot of those like racist footage um, coming out of anywhere is always like happening at train stations or like uh, bus stops. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I had a bit of like anger as well towards mm. those moments. I remember <laughs> I remember once we had this like school sports event where like lots of different schools got together and there was like a group of girls like saying some like racist comments and I got so mad I I think I like sprayed water on them or something <laughs> like I, I, I don't I don't suggest you fight back with violence but you know what I mean like yeah I also didn't want to like when I felt like I could fight back like I would yeah because you don't want to I don't know. I don't know if that's the right way to go about it, but... I think at least you did something about it because a lot of times these moments, we always feel like we just have to swallow it. There's nothing we could do about it. But then there's always that anger. I mean, even now I would still carry with me sometimes, which is thinking back on those moments, thinking that, am I just supposed to swallow this Mm. just because someone was having a bad day or, Mm. you know, they decided to be racist, um... You know, obviously there are moments we were thinking, oh, I wish I could punch the person, but of course this is not the right thing to do and we shouldn't get ourselves in that kind of situation. But I think that's probably Mm. like your initial reaction. You just needed to get the energy out of you and then that took the form of spraying water. I think so. I think like (laughs) there was definitely not the right approach, but I think it's still you got to do something in the beginning and then mm-hmm. and then you can reflect back and think, oh, okay, how could I have done that in a more civil way? Um, it's but hard. I think, but I was a kid. <laughs> I was a kid and, you know, even now I find mom- like, it's still really tricky to navigate mm-hmm. these things. Like if you, f- you hear something and you're like, hang on a moment, was that racist? Yeah. But then you're like, I don't even know how to go about it sometimes. Like I don't even have the vocabulary sometimes to – because you can't, like, you don't want to fight. I don't want to fight back with anger and mm. reciprocate, you know. But then how do I be that cool person and say the right thing? Exactly. And educate them at the same time. But, like, you know, like, it's so hard. I know. To, it's so hard. I don't know. Um, and sometimes when they decide to be a jackass, you know, like they could just say something in front of you and then they just walk off. And then you're just left there. You're just like, what? what just happened and then when you are ready to fight back or when you're ready to say something the person's already gone oh (laughs) yes you're like damn it and yeah I know what you mean yeah I think I think it's hard it's something that we're still all of us are still trying to um still learning yeah but I think I do believe in like being kind even though it is sometimes these things can be mean i yeah, I do feel like there's a kind approach to it. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I don't – and when I can, I do say, like, I, that I don't feel uncomfortable. You know, like, sometimes people do, like, funny racist jokes. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't think of one right now, but they'll be like, oh, oh yeah, because you're Asian. Like, you're cheap because yeah. you're Asian, whatever. I'll straight up not laugh. <laughs> I'll just be like, that, that makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and then they blame it on us as well. We're like, oh, why? It's like, why so serious about this? It was just a joke. It was meant mm. to be funny. It was like, well, funny for you, but not for us. <laughs> I think things have changed so much here in mm-hmm. Australia that it doesn't happen so much anymore. That's good. It's people are so careful with what they say. They don't even ask like how old you are. Like people don't ask where you're from. Like at least in the workplace, everyone is so respectful and they're wow. so careful. Um, I think it's really different. I think it's changed so much and there's so much about like, you know, having everyone be inclusive and, you know, every campaign has a colored person in it now, Mm. you know, it's, there's a whole movement towards being so inclusive and respectful to one another. So it's quite rare now to catch people saying that, at least in the workplace. Okay. I'd say. 
Mm. I mean, just a follow up question because, like, you grew up Korean as well. Um, did you ever spot any differences when K drama or like people were like, "Wow, you're Korean. That's really cool." You know, like K drama. <laughs> Do you think that ever made a difference for you? <laughs> um, it's so funny because somebody actually said that to me the other week. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was like, he was like, oh, it's such a good time to be Korean. And I was like, oh are God. you serious? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't know. I just thought it was really funny because I feel like it's been a while since this whole movement's been happening and that Korea has been getting all this attention. So I feel like it's nothing, it's not really new to me anymore. And I don't think of it as... I don't know. I, I think of I think of it as it's a really cool thing that I can connect with more people mm-hmm. on on K pop and K drama because it's something that I used to grow up with, right? So like going back to the Korean breakfasts that I used to have, mm. like I would have like a Korean side of me, and then I'll have like the white version of me, and they didn't really mix. Like during school hours, I would be non Korean, right? And yes, I will have my Asian lunch boxes sometimes, but once I'm home, we'll play like the video tapes, like Korean dramas, the variety shows, Music Bank, you know, all the K-pop, you know, the first wave of Korean pop. I was listening to all the music every week. We'll, I remember we'll always get five to six video tapes, and I'll consume Korean content like that. Right? Wow. I remember it was like one dollar <laughs> a video tape. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> and I always we there used to be like these video stores where you can rent videos. Yeah, and I would be so proud because they'll have these like little cards, like membership cards, like little cardboard, and they'll write down like what which card in which videos you you're renting, right? Mm-hmm. But we were number two, like we were the second customer of the video <laughs> show, and people would be like, "Oh, I'm number like five hundred and something," <laughs> but we were like, so, we were there like early, and we were just so proud that we are like. Wow. one of the first customers so having like consuming korean content was always like a very big thing for me but mm-hmm. as i said very separate like within school hours i'm you know the white version of me and then outside of school hours even on the weekends i was like part of the korean church community i went to korean school i hung out with my korean friends you know mm-hmm. and so it was always like two very divided worlds yeah but now with netflix and k-drama and k-pop and bts and blackpink people in the workplace are like oh did you watch attorney woo on netflix Mm. (laughs) or you know what i mean it's like not even like parasite or like the really big ones it's like just a normal k-drama like oh did you watch it oh yeah that episode was so good you know what i mean it's like part (laughs) of normal conversation now and it's just like really cool that i don't have to like it's just cool to see my my two worlds merging so it's just an exciting thing for me but i don't really see it as like people see me differently and plus Mm -hmm. i don't think they i don't think a lot of people know i'm korean they just um they're like a lot of people are like, oh, you're Korean. They find out later. But I don't know. I have the most Korean name, <laughs> Julia Kim. Do you think people will know? But no, they I don't guess know. sometimes people just don't know. It's like, they don't um, know. Or East Asians, they are used to being asked, oh, are you just Chinese? You know, something. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people think I'm Chinese because I don't look that Korean. You know how there's like Korean beauty standards? Mm, and like, mm. I, I don't, I must not. Maybe it's my eyebrows or something, but a lot of people don't think I look that Korean. Like, they can't guess. I don't know. I see. Yeah, yeah. it's actually really cool, and you. It, it's so true for a lot of um, kids who grew up outside um, Asia, like third culture kids. Um, there are multiple sides of them, and like you mentioned, sometimes they don't actually merge. Like when they're hanging out with, um, let's say, their Asian friends, they play up the Asian side. They would suddenly sound yeah. um, like very Asian. It's kind of yeah. like that coat switching, right? But then when you're like with your white colleagues, and then you would just literally become a completely different person but then all sites are still you (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah 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 that I love I love that third culture like that group Mm -hmm. that was like mind-blowing for me knowing that there's like 
a whole other group of people who are even in a more unique mm-hmm. situation. Um, but yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting to hear about all the different growing up experiences of our Asian guests around the world. Mm. But um, now we're moving into the topic that we are actually going to talk about, which is the redundancy experience that you had a little while ago, because I think in one of your recent podcast episodes, you mentioned you were made redundant from your previous job and you kind of shared really generously about your experience, you know, how you coped with that. So um, for our listeners who might not have listened to that episode, can you briefly tell us about what happened? Yeah, sure. So I was made redundant, I'd say about three months ago now, and it was my first experience being made redundant. Um, what happened? So basically my company was kind of owned by like a bigger company and that bigger company decided to buy, like an acquire another company similar to my company. Okay, I'm getting really complicated now, but anyways, they decided that they didn't really want our company around anymore. And basically they made... Okay, long story short, they made the whole company redundant, but I was part of the first group of people that got made redundant. Mm -hmm. So we all saw it coming, but because we knew about this acquisition since the beginning of this year, so we knew change was coming. We knew this meant, you know, something is happening. Maybe we're going to move to another company or maybe they're going to get rid of us or maybe they're going to, I don't know. We knew that it was, or maybe we are going to operate as is, but we Mm. just knew that with the way things were happening, like it was not, I don't know. We just knew something was like, there was change coming. So everyone was sort of in this limbo state for, I would say like six months. Wow. Yeah. So long. Yeah. So we were literally like doing work, but for what? We don't know for what. You know, Mm. and in the end, anything that we worked on, we were kind of like, yeah, but what's the point? So the morale was not good. I was quite mm, demotivated. I didn't see the point in anything. So I kind of used that downtime actually um, to work on myself and do things I wanted to do and what I enjoy doing. Um, So it was kind of a good sort of time for me as well um but it was weird it was a very yeah. weird time where we just in yeah limbo there's no other word I can describe it and exactly then, I mean to be mm, left hanging for that extended yes. period of time and then you don't know you know should I start saving yeah. up to prepare myself for being jobless or what should I be doing yeah and then it's just like a lot of your maybe personal life decisions are kind of like left on hold because of the uncertainties, right? Exactly. So some people really felt like their careers were put on hold because they're not. We're not developing. We're not get. We're not growing. We're not learning anything. We're literally just in a standstill. And oh, I should mention that they also offered like a retention bonus. So they said mm. in the beginning of this year. If you stay till this time, we will give you a little bonus. So we had this like carrot dangling in front of us as well. Like, but we had to wait like nine months for this, right? A little bonus. And honestly, that bonus worked so well. Everyone stayed. No one quit. No one quit. (laughs) Because everyone just thought, I might as well stick around, see what happens. If, they, if mm. it wasn't for that bonus, I think a lot of people would have looked for new roles. Why did the company do that? Is it because they wanted to keep the people around before they can choose and pick which one to let go? <laughs> <laughs> they did that probably because of that too, but also because just in case they decide to keep the company as is. Mm, I see. If they want to just keep it running, because they, they didn't know what was happening either. But they knew that they wanted us to stick around and they could afford to pay a little bonus if we did. Um, That's so confusing. Yeah, so it was a really weird time. But I was just like, oh, every month I'll be like, oh, okay, five more months to go. Okay, four more months to go. Okay, three more months to go. Just counting down. And then for us, before 
that date came, they were like, hey, guys, can you come into the office tomorrow? Um, do we have a business uh, update? Oh, my God. <laughs> and then you're like, duh, it's happening. Uh, I knew it. I knew it. I was like, okay, we need to go into the office. Um, it's weird. I have a meeting booked in at 10.30 a.m. with Hey Char. You know, it's just weird. You know, mm. you know it's coming. So I wore my black coat and I wore like a black outfit because I knew it was like kind of like funeral vibes, you know. Oh like God. Dressed for the occasion. I, I dressed for the occasion. <laughs> and when I went into the meeting, I took all my things with me. Like, you know how you can just leave your laptop at your desk? But I packed my bag because I knew what was coming. So I just packed my bag and then after the meeting, I just walked out because mm. it's. Oh I knew it'd be awkward, right? Like you, you've been just made redundant. You walk back into the office. It's like the walk, not a walk of shame, but it's like, ugh, I know. That's why I thought, nah, I'm gonna just take my stuff with me. Uh huh. Um. So you didn't have to go back to the desk and go through the whole pack like, my bag yeah. and mm. yeah. It, oh it's it was really awkward because there were some people who didn't do what I did and they came back in, packed their bags and walked out in silence. Um, So awkward. It is really awkward. It is really awkward. Wow. So everyone in the company sort of was feeling this sense of like, oh, something is coming, Um, like they could be let go any moment, so including yourself, right? But I'm Mm. just wondering when that finally happened, when you walked out of the office you know, what were some of the initial feelings or, or even a day or two after that? You know, what kind of feelings came up and mm. like, how did you eventually pick yourself up? I think a lot of people feel shock when this happens, but I think I didn't really feel shock because mm-hmm. I knew this was coming. I already knew for so long, for like months, since the beginning of the year that this was coming. So for me, the biggest feeling I had, because I was like, what is this feeling? And I like getting in tune with my feelings, Isabel. I was like, oh, what am I feeling right now? And I was like, after I got me redone, I'm like in my black coat. I'm like, what am I feeling right now? And I, I thought, oh, you know what I'm feeling? I'm feeling relief. Like mm. I feel so much relief right now. Like finally, because the finally suspense I've is been, over. Yeah, mm. I've been waiting for this. Yeah, the suspense as well, the dreaded meeting is over. So I felt a huge sense of relief from that. And also now that I know that the deed is done, I knew I couldn't move forward. Mm. Uh, so it was a little bit, I was a little bit curious. And oh, I was sad as well. I was mm. sad that, it was an end of an era and I, it was sad that I won't see my colleagues, you know, anymore. And we got, we got really close as well. So I was just sad that, yeah, you know, I was sort of grieving mm-hmm. for those good times um, with them. Yeah. Wow. But it was quite weird. It was a weird feeling. I think maybe the positive out of it was maybe you did not feel as alone as some people who go through redundancy could be feeling Mm. because you know that probably the whole company is kind of going through the same thing as you but you mentioned you knew it was coming other than you know the announcement of that acquisition the company restructuring were there any telling signs that you were able to pick up and think that okay I might be let go at some point I think just like the chit chatter, like mm. what people mm. are saying or like what, because people start talking to you in code and you're just like, what are you really saying? And it's so confusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a little bit of that, like when start, people start talking to you in code, you know something's up. Mm. Um, I think, yeah, nothing too obvious. The main one was the that meeting that was booked in, like, please come mm. into the office. Like, that was the most obvious one. Um, but nothing, yeah, nothing else that I can really mm. think of. Yeah. So you, 
right after the redundancy, you felt relieved, a bit sad. So what was the first thing that you did after the initial, you know, period uh, or like wave of emotions um, settled? Mm. So I think on the day of the redundancy, I knew, I, I sussed out who, I knew who some of the people were who got made redundant. So we had Yamcha together. <laughs> Which is like dim sum. <laughs> we call it yum cha here. Do you call it yum cha or dim sum? Um, both, both. Oh, okay, both. Yeah. Okay, we call it yum cha, and uh. um, yeah, we had yum cha, and then there was like about seven of us. So I felt very. I think that was really nice that we got to have this like final supper sort of thing <laughs> together. <laughs> um, and yeah, I didn't feel alone. I really mm-hmm. didn't feel alone because. I had the other people there who was the other people who got me redundant. And then we created a little WhatsApp group. Mm. And then that was really nice. Um, we kept checking in on each other, like, how's everyone doing? You know, are you guys still in shock? How are you feeling? And that kind of thing. So that was really nice to have that little mini support group. Um, I remember it happened on like a Wednesday. And I remember on Thursday and Friday, I just let myself do nothing and just do no job hunting, like no, you know, like nothing too hard, just taking it really easy, um, you know, just quiet, gentle activities. Mm -hmm. Um, I think just to like ease myself into it. Um, and, th- and a little bit of fun things too. I think I, I did a little bit of like shopping maybe, um, whatever you enjoy. And I told myself I'll start like on Monday, mm. um, like the job hunting process. So I definitely let myself just relax um, and be kind and do what I needed, what I want to do um, because I knew. That's good. I knew there were going to be harder days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a really nice situation to be in. You have the support group. And I mean, I think the most important thing, not even just in redundancy or like if anyone is going through any difficult situations in life, like letting yourself just feel however you feel and taking that time to rest and just relax and process everything that you have to before deciding what you're going to do next is actually like really beneficial but what about um one of the aspects in life of course like when it comes to redundancy it could be a bit of a disruption for the money side of things right it could even be a shock for some people financially if they have some obligations so how did you go about getting things in order I think I everyone was very different um I realized like some people, everyone was in a very different situation. Like the way I saw it was there were people with mortgages, there were mm-hmm. people with kids and mortgages. Um, there's And then there's like people who have less responsibilities. And I sort of fell in that bucket. It's just me and my partner and my dog. Um, and I think I always wanted to be a little bit prepared for something like this. Not fully, fully prepared, but the bare minimum that I sort of – prepared for myself is to make sure that I have a job that will give me a pay like redundancy pay if I was made redundant when I was working for like a smaller company I knew that if I was made redundant there they wouldn't provide me with a package because in Australia I think if you if you're working for a company under like 25 employees don't quote me on this but if it's like an x amount they don't have to pay you anything they can just literally cut you off Um, make you redundant and not pay you and when I found out about that I was like oh my god that could happen to me any day you know and I'm working so hard for this company but they could cut me any day so I think I always wanted to work for a larger company in case something like this happened so I think because I I knew there was a redundancy package um, I wasn't too stressed about it and I don't have a mortgage and mm. um, stuff like that. So I think for me, I was sort of okay to go um, jobless for a little bit. And I knew I would be okay with that, at least financially, but maybe not mentally, because 
know, mm. when you're doing nothing and you yeah. you don't want to see, you know, you don't want to use the money. You want it to be bonus money, actually. And, um, yeah, so I think for me it was not too bad. Uh, and I think I was in a lucky, very lucky position. And it just makes me think, you know, if I do have a mortgage or if I do have children, I definitely would want to be prepared. You know, just have yeah. a buffer. That's I think that's the bare minimum I could do for myself in the like speaking for future me, like just have a little buffer um, because this could happen um, at any time to anyone. Yeah. Have you heard from, you know, like any of your ex colleagues who might have those kinds of financial obligations? Like, have they ever shared or talked about that? I think everyone was different. And I think a lot of people didn't realize how stressed they were until. Mm afterwards Mm. I think everyone was just trying to find something and you know um so yeah it was more like the focus was on the focus was on finding something like the Mm. right role and everyone was just like focused on that goal um we didn't even want to think too much about what would happen if we don't um but I think the redundancy pay that really helped Mm everyone yeah. because at the end of the day we can always say to each other guys we're getting paid out you know this is great you know um so I think we were all okay that's cool yeah and yeah you raised a really good point for maybe like listeners who are looking for jobs it's always important to check on the contract if um there's anything that's mentioned about redundancy and what will happen um, if you're made redundant or I don't know. I mean, you mentioned in Australia, um, it's actually legal for companies with smaller sizes to not pay people out. Right? I'm not really sure if this is a thing in Hong Kong, but I think at least for most of the companies that I've worked for, there will always be kind of like a term in the contract that, oh, um, if the company decides to terminate, the employment there would be this amount of um, money at least to like pay you out so Mm. it's so important to be looking for those kinds of details um, in the work contract and it's been a few months after um, your redundancy so you know like looking back do you have any tips to offer to anyone um, on how to really cope with redundancy like what are the step-by-step guide you know to manage that <laughs> emotionally personally or financially I think it's the same sort of steps when you approach any kind of hardship I don't think it's any different because it's redundancy so I think this is sort of the step-by-step um, guide that I would give myself if I you know for my next hardship so I'm kind of speaking for my future me but this is what I did I think the first step was number one was process it like give yourself that time to actually just sit there and just process what just happened (laughs) because sometimes I feel like at least in my 20s I think I skipped that step the mm. processing step and it's actually such a key part of you know moving past something like this because if you don't process it you don't you're kind of ignoring it and you're kind mm. of burying it and if you don't process it when it happens even though it might be uncomfortable it's like it resurfaces in a weird way at a weird time yeah <laughs> maybe years later or you might channel yeah. that energy into the wrong place or to the wrong person and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? That's true. So I think processing it is um, the most important first step that it's a new thing that I do. So I literally just sit there and I'm like, okay, what just happened? And yeah. then like I sort of think about it and really think about how I'm feeling And I'm like, oh, yeah, I am feeling relief right now and just validating my own feelings and just patting myself on the back. And, you know, I would journal, but honestly, I've Mm. been really lazy lately, so I don't journal as much. But even just talking to my friends about it and just really, yeah, being in tune with how I feel and sharing that with um, close people around me, um, And then the other thing that I did was 
So after I processed it, I I like connecting with other people. I find a lot mm. of support from speaking to other people. So I think I shared my experience with other people as well that I trust. And I also asked them to check in on me mm. <laughs> proactively. So I said, can you check in on me once in a while? Because right. I know I'm okay right now, but I know like week three, week four, I know I'm going to be a bit lost. Mm. Like once I'm, you know, apply for all these jobs and I don't get it or whatever, like week four, week five, I 100% know I'm going to be probably going to be in a slump just knowing mm. me. So can you please check in on me around then? Um, and I also requested <laughs> to my friends, I said, can you please ask me not whether, how, like, don't ask me how my job hunt is going. Mm. Can you just ask me what hard thing that I did or what did I put effort in lately? It was mm. a very specific, it was such a specific request. And then it was so cute because few weeks later I got like a few messages from some friends that are like <laughs> there's not even like hey how are you it's literally just what what effort did you put in lately <laughs> what what hard thing did you face lately and I just felt so touched because number one they really like listen to me and like even though they don't really understand my request but they still listened and also that question, it always gives me strength because rather than focusing on the result, it's like, yeah, you know what? Like the hard thing that I did was I got rejected like from three jobs today, but I still applied for another role mm. even after that. And I, yeah, I pulled myself up and I applied for that role and I did it. Um, so being able to share that. So I think focusing on what I did that was hard rather than what the outcome was. Um, yeah, that was a big sort of shift. So um, wow. kind of going all over the place now. But that was um, one of the things that I asked my friends to do, check in on me, but asking those specific <laughs> questions. And yeah, and then once I kept doing that um, and focusing, I guess the third thing would be focusing on the, my effort over the result. Um, and that just helped me to keep going. So I'd say like to summarize, one, process it, two, get support from friends, ask them to check in on you, and number three, focus on the effort that you put in, not the result. Um, and in this instance, the result was whether I got a job or not or mm -hmm. whether the interview was successful um, or whatever. Yeah, it could be anything. Or if this, if it's a salary that I wanted, you know, uh, try not to focus too much on – the outcome but focus more on how much I'm putting myself out there or yeah how I lifted myself up and yeah patting living myself on day the back. by day yeah, yeah day by day and focusing on the daily little efforts and seriously that really really helped me nice. um, to have a lot wow. of strength yeah yeah that's so important when you said you, you need to allow yourself to process it because a lot of people would tend to just brush their like whenever they feel negative emotions coming up they would just like brush them aside and like you mentioned if, if you keep on hiding that you keep on like not letting those negative um, emotions manifest themselves then it will end up you know like backfire or implode at some point yeah. and um, <laughs> it's so important to let all of your emotions even though you feel like oh I shouldn't be feeling this way but if you do feel that way then let it be mm. you know let all your emotions run their course that's really how you can ground yourself or like in a way it's kind of reorientation um because after all those emotions are gone you're back to kind of your neutral self yeah I I, I, I totally know what you mean and I think if you don't let those emotions come out like I feel for me like I can feel it in my body so mm. sometimes I like I have like tension I get tension in my shoulders and sometimes I think you know what I think this is from years of like not letting myself just feel it I think I'm just like trying to fight how I feel so I tend to like clench or like tighten my body so I think it, it is really important to just sort of keep letting go and letting go and even you know even if, whether it's feelings or whatever That's it true. is 
Your um, back otherwise... pain can be related to your emotions, everyone. <laughs> yes, guys, <laughs> if you have back pain, you need to check in on yourself. Check in yeah. on your feelings. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's true, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was gonna ask you, like, for friends and family who want to show their support for like anyone who is going through redundancy, what can they do? I mean, um, you kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, which was that you, like, your friends listen to you and then they checked in on you. But other than that, um, would there be any like tips or advice that you could have for like friends and family who know someone who's going through like hardship or redundancy? Hmm. So I had a friend who got made redundant recently as well, like after me. And I think I, what I just said to him was, is there any way I can like mm. support you? Like, how can I support you as a fellow person who w- literally just went through what you went through? But he didn't know how I could <laughs> support him. So I I think it was too much of a vague like mm. question. Um, so I said, do you want me to just check in on you, like message you once in a while? And he said, yeah, that would be nice. Mm. So I think even just that, like even asking them, like, can I check in on you? Are you okay? Because that opens the door for you to just send that check-in text. Yeah. And it's not so random. It's like, okay, you said it was cool, so I can check in on you now. Um, So I think definitely, like, those check-ins and you know it's so easy to send a text message and even I feel like the question is like oh people would tend to ask I mean obviously they mean well they'll be like oh let let me know how I can help but then in a way it might be seen as a burden for the person who's going through hardship because the person might not have the mind space to really think about how they would like to be helped so I think you know, like actually asking, oh, do you want me to send you daily text messages? Or maybe, it's, oh, do you maybe need some financial help? You know, like kind of make them a little bit more tangible and make it easier for the person to say yes or no helps a lot. Mm, that's true. Ask a question whether it's like a yes mm. or no rather than make them like think so hard because yeah. they don't have the mental capacity to even think about it. Yeah, I think... I agree with that. So keep it simple. It's like, yeah, I think that's why when I said, can I check in on you? It was a no brainer answer. It's like, mm. yeah, yeah. Check in on me. Um, but it's hard, cool. right? It's really yeah. hard. But I think you yeah, definitely keep the connection. Um, and as long as you can't, you can't fix their situation, right? Like there's, there's no, you can't do that. But what you can do is let them know that you care about them and you're there. Yeah. It's like, you know, you know, I'm here. I'm always going to be here. Um, I think, yeah. I think that's And key. also kind of like maybe even just asking to hang out, get them out of that situation for an afternoon, a few hours. It, it really helps. And um, after going through um, being made redundant, I'm wondering if you also have any thing you could share with our listeners when it comes to um, looking for a, new job for example uh, maybe very specific situations like how to communicate with recruiters or HR people from a new company you know how do you communicate your redundancy um, but at the same time still are in the position of being able to negotiate for a salary package that's not really a low ball offer because it just seems like if like recruiters or HR know that you were made redundant they feel like it will be their chance to give you um, a really cheap package Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that I asked my fellow redundant friends was, hey, are you guys telling recruiters that you're made redundant? And all of them said, no, um, there's no need. And no one asks. No one asks and they don't know either. Um, so in the beginning, I didn't really say that, uh, you know, my reason for mm. leaving. I was just very vague about it. Um, but towards the end, I was more open about it. I didn't really feel that recruiters saw that as a problem. I, if anything, it was sort of seen as a good thing because I can start work immediately. So mm, <laughs> it was true. almost like a plus for me. So in the end, I just, I prefer being honest and just being open. Um, and I think that worked well for me. I think the thing that I really learned from this um whole interviewing process this time around is that 
interviewing for jobs is like a complete skill and most people aren't really good at it. Like I was definitely <laughs> not good at it. I think the first five five interviews, I was like so rusty because if you haven't done a job interview in a while, how are you meant to be good? It's like, what are your strengths and weaknesses? You know, all those really basic questions. I couldn't even answer them because I was just not prepared at all. And I think I was sort of beating myself up a little bit. Like, oh my God, I didn't prepare enough. Or I didn't answer that question right. Or that was such a basic question. Like, you know, even the tell me a little bit about yourself. That, you know, the first mm. um little That's spiel that the you do hardest. it's you know hard. the first few sentence you're just like what do I even say? Uh, uh, my name is <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like do I talk about like my uni days as well like or is that too far back now like oh like do you talk about the cultural background I mean I think this happens to a lot of like Asians <laughs> like <laughs> do you have to state what you are <laughs> yeah it's like you just don't know if what is TMI so you're just like yeah. oh my gosh but I think you know, over time you start finessing it each Mm. time and you get more and more confident. And I think definitely like more practice, even if it's just speaking to a wall, just practicing your voice and doing the interviewing, like pretending you're in it. I think that really helped. Um, I thought a really good tip that I heard was that you shouldn't be interviewing just during these periods anyway I heard that you should be interviewing all the time yeah you you should always be interviewing and I thought that was such a like it was so I don't know it really clicked to me because I thought yeah why have I left this interviewing thing right till this moment I it would be so good if I'm always you know do an interview like once a month like put yourself out there because you don't even know what can come up from that anyway but also continue like continuously practicing your interviewing skills is that's true it's gonna come in handy you can Um, never have too many interviews you can never you can (laughs) never and you know we do this podcasting thing right but you know this is so different to a job interview (laughs) it's so different (laughs) so yeah it's really good to keep um practicing that interviewing muscle yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, that was the sort of the biggest sort of eye-opening thing. Like, yeah, I'm not very good at it, but it's okay not to be good at it because you don't do it. So do more and just you, you just learn something from each interview. Yeah. And now that I have a job, I haven't done any interviews yet, but it does. <laughs> but I do keep my mind open. Like I always look for other jobs, always, you know, now I'm like, you know, you can be cut off any time. Yeah. That's true. You can be made redundant tomorrow, or you get might get fired tomorrow for some weird ass reason, right? In a way, like a nine to five job is no longer. You know, like a lot of people would think, oh, if they like stability, they're going for a nine to five job, right? But like you mentioned, anything could happen these days. And honestly, your full time job that you're currently doing is probably should just be seen as one of the ways um, where you make income rather than like all of yourself. So that brings me to ask you, because like when we were chatting a little earlier, I asked you if you had any important lessons or um, if you view redundancy any differently, you know, um, more than three months on. And you mentioned there was a little bit of a mindset shift um, for you. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? I think it was the realization that yeah there is no such thing as stability there is really no such thing as stability you definitely like everything that you just said Isabel like you can't rely on one stream of income it doesn't mean that I have multiple streams of income (laughs) but I'm always looking for other ways and I understand that yeah you you can't put all your eggs in one basket I'm always Mm -hmm. trying to find other ways of income like I always want to build a little bit of the you know an avenue for freelancing for example it's something that I'm always chipping away at Uh, I have like a little Upwork account like just in case you just don't know what can happen even with the podcasting thing Mm -hmm. or even like I have a side business selling like dog collars even that like just little things like I keep trying to build little things outside of my job because 
at the end of the day, a job is just a job and they can literally just cut you off at any time and speaking from experience here. <laughs> so I think definitely like, yes, really got to think about what stability means. Um, and also I think starting my new job, the mindset shift that um, you're talking about here, Isabel, is like I, I sort of just take my job now like day to day I don't mm. think of it as this thing like oh I gotta stick around here for like two years or three years or four years I don't think of it like that because now I know they can cut me at any time like I literally have this like <laughs> m- mindset and oh actually I started this job as a contractor as well mm. so I, I went into this job thinking I'm gonna finish up in three months ah. so that's why I kind of saw myself as like somebody who's not gonna stick around so I really just brought my myself thinking I'm gonna just do, take my day-to-day but you know I didn't I don't know I just felt less self-conscious mm. because I, I'm gonna someone who's gonna leave anyway <laughs> but by the way I'm full-timer now so I'm mm-hmm. sticking around hey. um, but I think that mindset of like thinking I'm not gonna stick around actually made me a better worker because mm. I was able to just be more confident and bring my authentic self like I don't really have like the person I'm at work and the person that I'm at home it's really not that different like I'm quite very very similar so I feel like work doesn't really feel like I need to put I have to put something on at least not in Mm. this job I feel like I can be myself and I think yeah just that mindset of like not caring Mm. (laughs) like I just don't care like I do care right but I don't care about all those little things I used to care about, like what people think. It's mm-hmm. like my mindset is now, I'm, I'm. this is my best work, I'm handed it in. If they don't see it that way, then that might be your problem. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I try not to think of it as like, before I'd be like, oh my God, I'd made a mistake, I'm going to freak out. But now if I make a mistake, I'm like, I'm human. If yeah. they have a problem with me being human, then there's something wrong with them, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it's just like, what's so wrong with making a mistake i mean for a lot of mistakes it's not going to cause the business to close down so like if you made a mistake then correct it and move on and that's it really like yeah i think i really don't get it when maybe like people could make a very big deal out of a really minor mistake well it might be just faster if we just correct it move on and that's it (laughs) yeah and i think like as long as the heart is good and your intention is good i think that's all that matters the fact that you made a human error you can't come on right so I don't know I think I've I've definitely just let go a lot more and I just care less and I think that's actually made it easier for me but also made me actually a better worker as well because I'm just focusing on the things that actually matter now like yeah I don't know I can't really explain it but it's just Mm -hmm. I just feel a lot more freer Mm. I'm glad you have reached this point, you know, um, I mean, this is very cliche, but then um, there's always some very important life lessons to be learned in every hardship. And so it just kind of sometimes we just have to like process all the emotions, the initial emotions, and then um, change the perspectives a little bit, be a little bit more reflective. Um, Yeah, so Jules, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us but before we close out the episode we still have one more segment to go which is rapid fires now in this segment i'll be asking my guests biased questions that they've got asked at some point in life but for jules case it will be misconceptions or assumptions that people might have about redundancy or even some negative self-talk that jules might have within herself when <laughs> coping with redundancy so jules are you ready to revisit some of these questions yes let's do it <laughs> all right first one you need to find a job straight away. No, I don't. I can take a break. Let me process it. There's a lot happening. This is not easy. I'm going to process it. I'm going to feel my feelings. And then when I'm ready, I'm going to look for a job. And the next one. 
Everyone else is getting a job right now. Why can't you find one? This one's hard because seriously, <laughs> when everyone else starts getting a job, and you're like, everyone oh is、God. different. <laughs> I know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's what I. That's what I told myself. I was like, why am I comparing myself to everyone else? Like,、yeah. it's everyone is on a different path. Everyone has a different job experience to you. Different job title, different jobs are in demand. Different companies are looking for different things. Like it's comp- there are so many variables. You can't compare yourself with the people around you. Your the right job for you will come at the right time. So just、That's、be patient. That's so true. That's so true. And、um, the next one is you should go on a big break and take a huge holiday. <laughs> Oh, this one's hard because it's like, you know, people did say that, or like I would say that to myself too. It's like, yeah, I could,、um, but you also want to be real as well. Like, you want, I want to take a break, but it's not that easy.、Mm. It's um, I'm so used to working all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, maybe I will take a little break. I don't know. I'll think about it. Yeah, but I I understand.、Um, even you know, like because you were dealing with redundancy, there was a bit of that you know emotions or anxiety going on. So even if you kind of like go on a trip, take a big break, you will still be carrying that anxiety with you. Yes, I think. exactly. I want to go on a break. Um, once I get a job, <laughs> free off the anxiety. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> And the next one is, you're made redundant because you are. Useless or not good enough. That is, is not true.、Yeah. This is not true at all. This is—it's actually your company's fault for not. Yeah, they seriously, your company could have done better to keep you around. But this is or, I, the way I see it is like it's like a lazier way to go about it.、Um, yeah. To make you redundant, it's got nothing to do with yourself. It's got to do with the way the company operates. Um, operates, so it's completely unrelated. Yeah, because、um, even in this kind of situation, it's so easy for people to just like blame the victim or you know the person's. Oh, you got let go. What's wrong with you? Like people don't actually ask the bigger questions like what's wrong with the business operation or what's、mm. wrong with resource management. There are bigger questions to ask than. You know the actual person who got let go, but、um, the next one, Jules. That's the end of your career. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. It's just one micro moment in、uh, your career. Yeah, that's true. Like it's just one. This is just one of the bumps in my career. It doesn't mean anything. I actually see this as an opportunity. Mm. It, this, I see this as an opportunity for me to try something different, and it's an open door somewhere else. I just can't see it right now, but I will find it.、Mm. Nice. And finally, in rapid bias, you should accept any job offers that come your way. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I will find the one that is right for me, and、mm. that feels right. I'm not desperate. Like I'm not gonna just take anything. I want to take my time with it. As I said, this is an opportunity, and I want to find the right one. Nice. Thank you so much for revisiting all of the self doubts or misconceptions about redundancy in this rapid fire segment, Jules. No worries. Thank you. For us to close out the episode, I'm just wondering if there are any final nuggets of wisdom, or because since this episode is going to be part of the Money Smart series, maybe very quickly, how would you describe your personal finance philosophy? Are there any money management tips or、uh, habits that you swear by? <laughs> <laughs> I I don't think I'm. <laughs> This is the hardest question <laughs> out of the whole.、One. I know. I also don't know what my philosophy <laughs> is. <laughs> I want to hear what yours is. I want. I wonder if it's similar、um, to what I have. I, I think, think if there's anything remotely, yeah, to do with that, it will be like、uh, tracking my expenses. Definitely know where my money is going. Hmm. 
I don't track my expenses anymore. Mm. I just sort of do like a rough, you know, like when I get paid, I put some here, there and here, there kind of thing. Um, like different, like different little accounts, um, like automatically. But I think my sort of approach at the moment, at least, is I always try and stay educated. Like I try and read books um, or like listen to content about how different people approach money. Mm. So I find that to be really interesting. So I always try and save a little bit. I try and invest a little bit and also spend it as well Mm. because um, I believe in experiences. Um also give back a lot so um you don't want to like just put all your money into your savings but you also don't want to just put all in investments because right now is important too so I think it's just having a bit of (laughs) balance but I don't know yeah I I don't know much about don't go extreme (laughs) yeah don't go all in one area but I think yeah having that balance is I don't know that's good having a balance is also a philosophy yeah <laughs> and um finally we always ask our guests on Pali Asian one last question and for you Jules um what does it mean to be proudly Korean Australian hmm. I think being Korean Australian means I just see it as I'm somebody who was born in Australia Mm. Who also eats kimchi. Um, and I think it's something that's not really defined, but it's something that will continuously get defined as time progresses. So mm-hmm. that's why, like, you know, doing the podcast and like creating, you know, media, like, you know, having more faces co- of color appear in media is important because we're part of like defining what Asian, Australian, or Korean Australian or Chinese Australian for example like means so I think I think it's something that doesn't um it's something that we create and I mean at the end of the day we are just individuals and you know everyone's experience could be different so I really love how you mentioned like you Jules will create your own Korean Australian story and experience and it could be completely different to like other Korean Australians as well so that's beautiful thank you so much for joining us on Proudly Asian I know it's really late for you in Sydney so (laughs) I really appreciate that you took the time to join us here oh no thank you so much for having me I I couldn't I'm having so much fun so I feel like (laughs) I went over time but thank you so much for having me Isabel it's been a blast That's it for this episode of Proudly Asian. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at proudly.asian for more content. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Leave us a five-star review on wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in and signing off for now. I'm Isabel Wong.